I'm afraid I'm going to be a little long-winded. I'm not sure. But a couple of announcements. First of all, uh, for those guys who uh, last week contributed a little bit to the donut tip and today did as well. Thank you so much for that. We did give our donut guy a $100 tip today and $100 to go to the donut lady who we've never met who makes the donuts all night long on Thursday night. And if you did bring something didn't were not able to drop it in yet, at the end, just drop it by the box there. We'll throw it in the team fund. But we did our take care of that, that Christmas tip for those people. So thank you very much. Also, today is uh, week 12 out of 24, so we're hitting the halfway point of the team season. It's hard to believe, but we're there. We're also heading into a two-week Christmas holiday break from teams. So the next two Friday mornings are holidays, obviously, with Christmas and New Year's Day. So we'll be off for two weeks. We'll be on again the first Friday, uh, the, the, the first Friday of January after the first. So it'll be the 8th, I guess. And so we'll see you there. I'll email you and make sure we all get started up again. Sometimes it's hard to start up again after two weeks off. But we'll get started in the new year and finish the second half of the team season. All right, uh, here's our story for today. <laughs> no, it's not. A, D a DEA agent stops at a ranch in Texas and talks to an old rancher. He tells the rancher, I need to inspect your ranch for illegally drone grown drugs. The rancher says, okay. You can do that, but don't go into that field over there, as he pointed out the, the, the field uh, to, the, to the west. The agent verbally exploded and said, look, cowboy, I have the authority of the federal government with me. And he reached into his rear back pocket, and the officer removed his badge and proudly displayed it to the rancher. You see this badge? You see this stinking badge? This badge means I can go wherever, wherever I want, on any land, no questions asked, no answers given. You understand, old man? The rancher kindly nodded, apologized, went about his chores. Moments later, the rancher heard loud screams. He looked up and saw the DEA agent running for his life, being chased by the rancher's 2,500-pound Santa Gertrudis bull. I didn't know what that is, but it's a giant bull. With every step, the bull was gaining ground on the officer, and it was likely that he'd sure enough get gored before he reached safety. The officer was clearly terrified and screaming. The old rancher threw down his tools, ran as fast as he could to the fence, yelled at the top of his lungs, Your badge! Your badge! Show him your stinking badge! All right, we're uh, in session 12, like I said, we've been talking about the uh, legacy of a man's life all season long. Uh, last week, we talked about the legacy of prayer and had a good discussion about prayer, like kind of a beginning discussion about prayer, how, how prayer is personal and prayer is a relationship, begins with honesty. Uh, and just so you know, um, those of you who are part of uh, our church and those who aren't can are certainly welcome to join us, but Jeff and I are going to begin a new series of messages the weekend after Christmas for four weeks. It's called Teach Us to Pray. It's four weeks uh, looking at the prayers of Jesus himself and what Jesus teaches us about prayer. So if you're interested in that, uh, come join us one of those four weeks or all four of those weeks, or you can always pick up the sermons uh, on our, we our website as well, fbcg.com, and see what uh, we learn from the prayers of Jesus in the New Testament. Today we're looking at the legacy of perseverance, and I want to show you... Um, a bit of a, cli a clip. I could show you the whole movie because the whole movie is about perseverance. But the movie Unbroken that came out last year or the year before. How many of you saw the movie Unbroken, Louis Zamperini? Well, look at that. Yep. A anybody read the book? A few of you? Yeah. The book's actually a little better. The movie is pretty good, but the book is uh, actually a little bit better. But the story of Louis Zamperini is the story of, of, of perseverance. Um, really a kind of perseverance few of us will ever even understand. Olympic runner captured by the Japanese during World War II and enduring during a horrific treatment during that time. And I want to show you just a little clip uh, from the movie that captures just a bit about uh, his life uh, as a runner and uh, camp and all that. This is a scene that takes place uh, in the prison camp. Oops, I always forget, I have to touch it twice. There is much talent in Omori camp. We have an opera singer. Who is the opera singer? We have a chef from Sydney, Australia. And we have an Olympic athlete. Who is the Olympic athlete? Who is the Olympic athlete? Yeah! 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 
out. You fail. You are nothing. <sighs> parts of the movie and parts of the book were very difficult to read because of the things you saw on the screen right there. We'll talk more about um, Louis Zamperini's story right at the end of today's session. <coughs> but that story is all about perseverance. Perseverance plays a huge role in the New Testament. And I'm going to try to take you through uh, what that means and why in just in the next 20 minutes or so. So look at the first text uh, in your booklet, Romans 5, 1 through 5. This is the Apostle Paul writing in the first century. He writes, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Let me pause there. In those couple of sentences, Paul summarizes the gospel. This is the gospel. I've said it here before, and I'll say it again. The Christianity properly understood is not a religion. It's a relationship. It's a relationship with God through Christ. We do not justify ourselves. That is, we cannot make ourselves good enough for a holy God. Being a pretty good person is not the goal. might be the goal of religion, but it's not the goal of Christianity. We are justified by faith in Christ. Our sins are forgiven through what Jesus did on the cross. That's the center of our faith, not in anything that we did. The Spirit comes to dwell in our hearts and begins to work in us and build in us peace and hope that's the outcome of the gospel in our lives. So that's the, Paul summarizes the gospel. We've been justified through faith. We have peace with God. We stand in grace. We have the hope of the glory of God. And then now Paul continues. He says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Okay, so the result of the gospel is transformation. God's love poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit working in us produces these qualities we've been talking about all team season and will continue to talk about. Goodness, mercy, generosity, peace, and hope. We don't generate those things ourselves in order to get God's grace, God's grace comes to us first and the Spirit of God begins to generate those things in us as God begins to work in and through us. I had a conversation with my, one of my sons, um, Micah, a couple weeks ago. He's up at the University of Minnesota. He participates in Athletes in Action and he's leading a small group of athletes in a Bible study. Some are Christians, some are not yet Christians. And he called me because the, the subject of suffering came up in their group and these young college guys are asking some important questions. And it has to do with the problem of suffering and evil in the world. It's one of the great theological and philosophical problems that many, many people struggle with when it comes to faith. Some look at the suffering of the world and come to the conclusion that God does not exist. They say, if God is all-powerful, the Bible says God is all-powerful and God is good, why is there evil and suffering in the world? Those things don't seem to go together. And some come to the conclusion that there must not be a God. Others look at suffering in the world and understand that that's the very reason for faith, it's the very reason that Jesus came into the world, what we celebrate at this time of the year. 
Now, here's the way I think the Bible teaches it. Uh, I'm going to try, this is going to be very brief, but you can do some reading and study on your own. I believe the Bible teaches us that sin and suffer, uh, suffering and evil are in the world because of sin. Uh, that sin came into the world because God created human beings in his own image. So Genesis tells us. And that image includes the gift of free will. That is, we are free moral agents. We can choose how we would like to live. Animals live on instinct. Human beings can choose. And he gave us this gift of free will because he loves us and wants us to love him back. And love is impossible without free will. For example, I'm a parent. Many of you guys are parents. I could protect my sons from the evil of the world by locking them in the bedroom. I could chain them to, in their room, and they would be protected from the evil in the world. I could also keep them from doing stupid things, from doing wrong things by doing the same thing. So that's the answer to all my problems. Just lock them in their bedrooms. But that wouldn't be love, would it? That would be something else. So we are created by God with free will for the purpose of love. Free will means we can choose to love and obey God, or we can choose to reject Him and pretend that we are God. Human beings, the Bible says, beginning in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, chose to reject God, His limits for us, His authority, and His love, and to pretend that we are God. Satan said, he didn't really mean that. He means you can be like God. And it happened in Genesis, and it's been happening ever since. God also has a spiritual enemy, the Bible says. And his name is Satan, along with many other names. Most theologians believe the Bible t tells us that sometime, at some point before the beginning of time, before Genesis 1-1, Satan was cast out of heaven because he became proud and set himself against God. So he's cast out of heaven, sets himself against God, and seeks to destroy all God made as good. So God has a spiritual enemy. So God has allowed evil to, to exist. God allows freedom of choice. So he allows sin and evil in the world because... Through our sufferings, we can learn and grow in ways we would not grow and learn otherwise. We need and experience God in ways we would not need and experience Him otherwise. And perseverance, I believe, is the mechanism for that growth. Now, I covered that very quickly, but the Apostle Paul here, if you notice, doesn't spend any time trying to explain the, the existence of evil and suffering in the world. He just assumes that evil and suffering exist because he sees the world through the theological lens of being a broken planet. The world is broken. The world has fallen into sin. And so, now, what is perseverance? With that as a backdrop, what is perseverance? Perseverance is courage plus faithfulness. That's how I want to start to describe it, first of all. Cur per uh, per perseverance is courage plus faithfulness. Let me tell you two stories. Uh, just yesterday, I was rummaging around in our attic, uh, and I was looking for something else, but I found an old scrapbook of mine from high school. I thought I'd lost it. I hadn't seen it in years, but it was in a bin. And so I dragged it out, and so my boys got, had some fun looking at these old pieces of newspaper clippings and photographs from when I was 17, 18 years old. And it reminded me of a story, which I've told here at Team before, of one of my high school teammates. I played football in high school. I was a quarterback. Um, and... We had a very small team. We only had like 22 guys on our team. It was our whole team, 22 guys. And one day in practice, we were running up, we ran a play, and our coach was a hothead. He had a real temper. This is back in the days when, you know, when they would take water away from you as punishment, you know, stuff like that. They can't do that anymore, but they grab you with your face mask and all sorts of stuff uh, back in the 70s, so uh, early 70s. So play didn't go well. Coach got mad. He made us do the same play again. Run it again. Run it again. I still remember what it was called. It was called Pro, uh, Pro Right uh, Blast Six, I think, something like that. Run it again. Huddle up, run it again, run it again. And he wanted us to run it perfectly. And now, so the second team guys are playing defense. We're play running against a live defense. So there's tackling and everything, hitting, tackling, every, every play. And since they knew, we were, he, he's just screaming out, run it again, run it again. So they knew what was coming, and all those guys want to look good. So they're stacking the play. They're running into the hole. They're not being made up. Every time we ran it, it got harder to run it because they knew what we were running. And I counted it took over an hour. We ran the same play 38 times. 38 times against live defense. You would never do that today. Same guy carried the ball all 38 times. Okay? He was captain of our team, a guy named Jack Foley. We called him Captain Jack. I, I, he was a tailback. So every play, I'm handing the ball. He's coming back more and more tired. He's getting hit every play. He's coming back tired. He's breathing hard. He's tired. He's breathing hard. He's got blood coming off his forehead. He's I'm, trying to, I'm trying to delay. I'm trying to give him time. I'm tying my shoes. Come on, coffee, get up to the line. I'm, I'm trying to buy him time because he's, he, he's, I'm just handing the ball off and standing there watching. He's getting killed, okay? 
about the 36th or 37th play, he comes back to the huddle, and he's making a funny sound. His eyes are glassy, and he's going, I realize he's got the wind knocked out of him. Okay, you ever had the wind knocked out of you? You feel like you're going to die, because you, you, you're certain you're going to die, and then you're afraid you're not going to die, right? <laughs> it feels terrible. He had the wind knocked out of him. He got up and walked back to the huddle. He's standing there like this. He can't breathe. I'm tying my shoes. I'm dropping my towel. I want the guy to live. Coach going, run it again, run it again. And that guy ran one more play like that. Was, I, I had tears of him coming out. It was the most incredible display of perseverance I ever saw. Kid was 17 years old. We're still friends on Facebook, and he barely remembers that story. And I tell him I still love him to this day. Interestingly enough, Jack became a Christian after high school and is an elder in his church in New York. Uh, a great guy. Perseverance. The second story has, is completely different, but same kind of perseverance. My mom. Uh, was 25 when she went to college because her parents didn't believe a girl should go to college. She grew up in eastern Kentucky in the hills in what we would call Appalachia. So she worked out of high school. And then she just really felt she should go to college. She became a, a follower of Jesus. She wanted to use her life for something greater than working for a tobacco company. So she went to college at age 25, okay? Was older than almost all the students there. Started her college degree, got married, had me on her first wedding anniversary, had to drop out of college to be a full-time mom. Chipped away at her degree over the next 15 years, or next 25 years. Finally got her undergrad degree at age 50. Then she went to grad school. Took her 10 years to finish her grad degree. Got her master's at age 60. Just because she believed she should finish what she started. Perseverance. Perseverance is uh, courage plus faithfulness. You might remember we've covered both of these topics already. Legacy of courage, legacy of faithfulness. We define courage as allegiance of something greater than your fear, doing difficult things. Faithfulness, which was the week I didn't make it here, but faithfulness in your notebook is keeping promises. So what's perseverance? The Greek word means to remain under, as remaining under pressure, remaining under the challenges of life, to endure with steadfastness. In the Christian meaning, it means to endure under hardship, trial, persecution, and pain, and to do so through faith, faith in the promise of Christ. In Hebrews chapter 12, we see a beautiful passage. It's not in your notebook, but write down so you can look, at it, look it up later. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul writing again, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that is, believers who've gone before us, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, that's where free will came in, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus becomes our model for endurance. He endured the cross for the joy set before him. We endure our current sufferings for the hope set before us. So perseverance could be called courage stretched out over time. Perseverance is faith stretched out. Perseverance is running one more play after the wind's been knocked out of you. Because of the goal, the hope, and for a football player, the goal is becoming a better team, winning the game. Perseverance is signing up to take your last class when you're 60 years old and everyone else in the class is in their 20s. Because of the goal, the hope, and that may be to get a degree. As Christians, we persevere in faith, we persevere in obedience, we don't lose heart, we don't give up because of the goal, the hope of Christ himself, the hope of glory, Paul says, which is the hope of heaven, the eternal reward. So why is perseverance so important that it's a legacy item? Because we live in a broken world. Life is hard. We all face pain. Because we have a spiritual enemy who seeks to destroy. Perseverance, secondly, is turning suffering into character. Perseverance is the mechanism by which we turn suffering into character. A few months ago, I saw a story in the newspaper, and I collect stuff like this. It was a 12-year-old boy named Colin Walsh, somewhere in the greater Chicagoland area, and he has cystic fibrosis, terrible disease. Uh, it, it causes your lungs to, to fill up with fluid and eventually takes your life by suffocating you, and there's no known cure for it, incurable. So kids just, just deal with it. I had a, a, a family friend years ago who had it, and every morning you could hear his mother would pound on his back until he coughed up all this stuff every single morning to try to live. Well, this little boy is 12 years old, and he uh, was just getting ready to compete in his eighth triathlon at age 12. Because he discovered, he and his parents and doctors discovered, because he loved sports, that intense exercise actually helped keep his lungs clear. 
So he started doing triathlons, running, biking, swimming, because the intensity of the exercise helped keep his lungs clear. So his perseverance actually produces greater health. And in the same way, our perseverance turns suffering into character. Paul says, we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Perseverance keeps us from wasting our suffering and pain. Persevering is the mechanism by which suffering is redeemed, turned into something better. Tim Keller, a pastor in New York City, has a terrific book. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, challenging read, but the book is entitled Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, one of the most complete theological treatments of suffering and pain that's on the market today, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. He suggests that Christianity is the only of the great world religions, the only one of the great world religions to have an adequate answer for the problem of suffering and evil. For example, Hinduism says it's karma, just karma. You get what's coming to you, and that's it, karma. Uh, others say it's just random. Christianity teaches us where suffering and evil comes from. It comes from two sources, from Satan, who is the enemy of God, and from human sin, which is using our free will to rebel against God. Faith and also tells us that, our suffering, that suffering and evil can be redeemed into good, into God's purposes. And you go all the way through the Bible, from Joseph, whose own brother sold him into slavery. At the end of his life, he said, what you intended for evil, God turned into good. To Paul, repeatedly arrested, beaten, thrown into prison. He writes to, uh, his, to believers in the, in the book of Philippians, he writes, what has happened to me, meaning being thrown into prison again in Rome, has actually turned out for good. The gospel is now being preached to Roman guards. And so Jesus himself, arrested, beaten, crucified unjustly, rose again, defeated the power of sin and death. By the way, there's a movie coming out in February. If you've seen any trailers, it's called Risen. Produced by Sony Pictures, not by a Christian production company, by Sony Pictures, called Risen. It's dealing with the resurrection of Jesus from the perspective of a secular Roman soldier, dealing with the question of why the body couldn't, have been, couldn't be found. Look up the trailer. I think it's going to be a very interesting watch. A secular movie made about the resurrection of Christ. Through the book of Revelation, when Christ redeems all things, destroying his enemy, Satan, casting him into the lake of the fire, and establishing a new heaven and new earth. By the way, the whole book of Revelation is a book about perseverance. The whole book of Revelation can be summarized by Jesus saying, hang on, I'm coming soon. Perseverance. That leads us to the third point. So perseverance is courage and faithfulness. Perseverance turns suffering into character. And perseverance refines and strengthens our faith. Refines and strengthens faith. The whole story of uh, Louis, Zamperini, Louis Zamperini is interesting. If you read the book, you realize the movie didn't tell the whole story. When he was um, convinced he was going to die, drifting through the Pacific Ocean for all those weeks, he uh, got to some point of desperation, and he prayed a desperate prayer. Remember this? He, he told God, if you allow me to live, I'll give my life to you and do anything you want. It's a basic desperation prayer, foxhole prayer, only he was in a raft in the ocean. He prayed that prayer. Well, suffered greatly. He survives the terrible ordeal, comes back home, and then struggles greatly to put his life together. He didn't, he didn't make good on his side of the deal right away. In fact, he began to drift into terrible alcoholism, probably in part caused by undiagnosed uh, PTSD. Eventually, his wife saw his life falling apart. She couldn't deal with it anymore. She encouraged him to go to a Billy Graham crusade in Los Angeles, one of the first Billy Graham crusades. He, re he, re he, re re uh, he resisted, resisted, resisted. Finally, just to shut her up, he decided to go one night. Here's Billy, Billy Graham preach. Comes home, nothing happens. Goes the second night. And about the third night he went, he remembered that prayer he made to God from the raft that he had forgotten. He went forward. He surrendered his life to Christ. To make a long story short, he was transformed and began to realize then, 10 years after his ordeal, that his suffering had actually played a role in bringing him toward the God he did not know. Powerful story. Suffering sometimes destroys faith. That's Satan's great strategy. He wants to destroy faith through suffering and evil. I've seen that happen to men. I've had men tell me, this happened, therefore I do not believe. It's like the athlete who wants to get stronger, goes in the weight room for his first workout, discovers that weightlifting is hard. The next day, all his muscles ache, so he quits. He doesn't want to hurt. Faith is like a muscle. It grows when you use it. It grows when it's tested. Sometimes suffering actually builds faith. James chapter 1 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. 
I remember um, when I preached in Russia 15 years ago at a sister church, before the service, the pastor took me into this little room with his elders, these old Russian men in their 80s, most of them, white hair, grizzled up guys sitting around this table. The pastor was about my age, and he introduced me to every one of these elders before, he, before the service. And he'd say, this is Brother, Brother Victor. And he would say a word about that, about that elder. And as I... St- I'm the guest, you know, they're trying to honor me. And as they went around the table, every single one of those men had suffered. He'd say, this is Brother Victor. He was in the gulag for 10 years because he was a pastor. This is Brother Dimitri. He lost two of his sons to prison because he was a believer. This is, and every single one of them around the table had had direct suffering because of what they believed. By the time they got done, I'm supposed to go out there and preach. And, I, and these guys had more faith in their little finger than I had in my whole body. Incredibly, hum, incredibly humbling experience. So if you want to grow, if you want to be mature, if you want to not lack anything, if you want our legacy to be complete, we must learn to persevere, to remain under, to keep trusting, to keep believing. And faith allows us to anchor our hope in Christ. And our hope enables us to persevere in love, in relationships, in truth, in goodness, in generosity, in mercy, in wisdom, in prayer, because faith is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, Years ago when I was still able to, in my 30s, I did a little mini triathlon, one of the smaller ones, and uh, right here in Crystal Lake, did it with my brother. I think we had to swim one mile, um, bike, like, how far did we bike? Like, 40 or 50 miles, and then uh, run six miles. So a mini triathlon. It was still challenging. It took a couple hours. And so we, we trained. We did all that stuff. And so for the entire race, we started kind of in the a, in a, in a back of the pack, and I barely survived the swim. But then we're, for the most of the race, we're passing people. You know, we're, we're biking. We're passing people, feeling good about ourselves. In the run, we're, we're passing people. And we get to within about, about 10 minutes. We've been doing this thing for about an hour and 50 minutes. And, and we're running together, and we're just coming down to the end, going to be all proud of ourselves and stuff. And I, become, I start to hear a sound coming from behind me. And it's a kind of a scraping, wheezing sound, like, like somebody running with a really weird running gait, like a scrape, wheeze, scrape, wheeze, <laughs> like that, right, coming up behind me. But it's getting closer. The sound is coming up behind me. It's getting closer. And, and I keep, in my mind, I'm thinking, boy, that, who are that is back there? They're really struggling. They're just, they're really, really struggling. I'm glad I'm not struggling. That, but they're really struggling. But the sound's getting closer. I didn't really put all that together. And then this woman passes us. She was like 20 years. She was, I was like 34. She, this woman had to be in her 50s. Gray hair, full body wetsuit. She's, she's running by us. And she had kind of a funny running gait. One of her legs went, went sideways. That was where the scrape came from. And she was wheezing in her breathing. But she passed us, which I could barely could compute. I mean, she was running. She... <laughs> It meant she was running faster than we were running. And it meant the whole race, the whole race since we started, she had been creeping up on us. <laughs> the whole race, the whole race. And she went right by us, and she beat us at the end. I thought, that's perseverance. She just kept on going. She kept on going. And it made me so mad that she kept on going. That's perseverance. Questions around the table. Think about perseverance in two ways. First, what role has perseverance played in your life, first in your, in your pursuit of a career? Do you have failure stories? Do you have persevering stories? Did it take you 25 years to finish your degree? What role did perseverance play in your professional life? And secondly, what role has perseverance played in the development of or the struggles you've had with faith? What role has perseverance played in your life? Talk around the table, get some donuts, I'll wrap you up right before 7 o'clock.